everybody. It's my name is Kylie Davis and I'm the founder and director of the PropTech Association. And it's great to see so many of you starting to join us here today on our fifth PropTech panel. Um, I'd especially like to thank our founding sponsors, Stone and Chalk, who have made this event possible. And for those of you who don't know Stone and Chalk, it was founded as a not-for-profit in Sydney in 2015 to help fintech startups commercialise and grow. And from 40 startups back in 2015, it now has around 200 startups in Sydney, Melbourne and Adelaide, covering all areas of emerging technology, including prop tech. And currently there are 20 prop techs that call Stone and Chalk home. And I'd also like to thank our new foundations partners at the PropTech Association, the Real Estate Institute of WA and Macquarie. So now, as we move out of lockdown and consider reopening our borders, is it time to ask, what does business as usual look like now in real estate? Is it just about going back to the old ways of listing, selling and marketing properties because, hey, they were good enough? Or, and are we going to um, experience a bungee spring back to tradition? Or are there things that we can take from that extraordinarily intense period of our lives into the new world that will make buying and selling and renting easier for our clients as well as for us? In this panel, we introduce you to three innovative prop techs who have showed us just how real estate agents could keep transacting during lockdowns. Now, first we have Peter Shravmaid and the team at Box Brownie who helped agents continue to produce quality photos for listings and marketing, even if they were shot by a cross-eyed tenant on a five-year-old iPhone. Nathan Krasansky from Home Prezzo helped agents solve the problem, well, if we can't promote properties, how do we even market ourselves with informative vi videos and report content based on market data? And Tom Dorowa from Virtual Tours Creator showed agents how easy and affordable it is to create virtual walkthroughs for potential buyers and tenants, even if you can't physically visit the property. So welcome, fellas. It's great to have you all on the panel. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. So welcome. Uh, yep. So Pete, let's kick off with you, seeing that you, you're the first one to say hello. <laughs> um, and um, and look, we all know each other, and, and everybody is from Queensland except me, shooting from uh, Sydney. Uh, so we can't, can't this help could you be that, a little Kylie. bit riotous. This well, we, this could can't, be a little bit riotous. Can't help you. Behave, it's, only a, it's only a plane ride away, Kylie. Only a plane ride. <laughs> I think I might need to drive. Um, so tell us a little bit about Box Brownie and the problem that you solved and how that worked during COVID. Yeah, so um, I mean, we we edit imagery, if you're not familiar with our services. It's the largest portion of what we do is we we will edit images. Um, a lot of it is professional photo editing. So, you know, sort of aside from agents, we will have people submit images to us to be edited. Um, it, uh, during COVID, uh, the largest issue that we were solving is uh, marketing issues for agents who couldn't get either professional photographers to site, they couldn't get to site themselves in a lot of instances. Uh, our Melburnians, Victorians will relate to that. Um, and we would, we would then um, assist them in, in creating some kind of system or solution to that problem. So, uh, for example, if you couldn't get to a property, a, a large portion of what we've been doing is editing uh, tenants photos or owners photos where they're taking them themselves um, you know even to the extent that we're redrawing floor plans that they create and um, we're assisting them with the with virtual tours um, so you, you know during COVID that that'd be the biggest portion uh, probably with virtual staging in their physical stages in in the US Canada and uh, UK and Europe were not allowed so um, you know that that was another another issue we solved. Sorry, so just wind back. So we're, what were you allowed to do? Uh, physical staging was... Oh, yeah, physical staging. Yeah, it was, so, yeah, yeah, it was but, not, not allowed. So every, everyone who was doing physical really moved to virtual staging in some way, shape or form. Okay, so how bad, are the photo, how bad can the photos be that you guys can still fix? Yeah, they can be pretty bad. Um, <laughs> I mean, we... we <laughs> The average agent doesn't take a good picture. Um, and then you sort of then go to the owners. Actually, if I had to, sorry, I know we've got a bunch of agents on the call, but if I had to vote, some of the owners would actually take a lot more time and attention to detail with their photography than some of the agents that we deal with. So, um, you, you know, um, it's, they, they, they can be bad. There, there are just things that happen, like um, a common issue we get submitted is, is low resolution or 
overexposed windows where you can't see outside the window, something's gone on there. Yellowy images is really big where you've got yellow lights, unlike the white one that's, we're kind of all rocking white lights today. Um, when you've got yellowy lights, it changes the color of the walls. So we added a lot of those things. Um, but, you know, there's some things we can't fix, like out of focus, half a house, we can't recreate what it, what we don't know. So I don't um, think you're trying hard enough, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, Kylie. I, I love the confidence you have in us. But, uh, <laughs> no, we, you, you know, when a photo is out of focus, um, we can give it our best shot. But quite often, you know, there's just some things that we can't do. So, so why is it so important? Even during, even during lockdown, why was it so important to get that photography right in real estate? Oh, it's kind of the crux. Um, it's the apex, actually. If you're becoming an agent, if you're a brand new agent, and, um, and the first thing that you want to do is go out there and list a house. Well, unfortunately, in this day and age, it's very hard to market a house without a photograph. Uh, all of our forums are geared for that. Uh, and it really doesn't matter what you're in, whether you're in property management, commercial, luxury, residential sales, um, it's really hard to market a property without a photograph. And it, it kind of comes at the start of the process, long before all of the other elements of describing the property to the purchaser are. So, you know, before you do a floor plan, before you write copy, before you've got video or virtual tours, the first thing that they're going to click on is that image. And you've really got to get that right to ensure that the, the knock-on effect and the click-through rate goes, goes through to the, to the remaining elements that you have. So did you take any measurements or do you know whether the photos that you guys were producing during COVID because professional photographers couldn't get there, were they being clicked more or less or the same as what you were seeing um, before we went into COVID? Yeah, it's really hard to tell. Um, obviously, you know, a lot, a lot of our, um, I, I suppose, realestate.com.au would have those stats here in Australia, but a lot of our um, heartland in America is fragmented MLSs. Um, there, there, are, there are defined stats though on, on better quality imagery, um, not just our own stats, you know, REA group has, they have uh, statistics that tell us that 76% of purchasers wanna see good photos uh, in the US, the National Association of Realtors. They have a killer stat that says that 84% of, of buyers, no matter which age group, wanna see professional imagery as an output. So. Um, you know, that, that's the, the most requested thing by purchasers over there. There's stats from the, the Guild of Surveyors in the UK that, it, that reflect that as well. So it's commonly held or commonly known fact that good imagery, not only do purchasers want to see it, but it'll sell you a house faster and for more money. So, you know, it's a bit of a no-brainer these days. And Australia tends to get that right, if I could just put a comment out, especially amongst residential sales in metropolitan areas, the quality of imagery that we have here in Australia is is fairly high um, it, with rela with relation to the rest of the world. Yeah. Do you guys have a declutter filter, or do you do you get asked to declutter a lot? <laughs> we we do. Um, in particular during COVID, um, yep. it, owners are taking photos. They have no experience uh, preparing the property. Um, uh, we've been doing a lot of decluttering on virtual tours because the owners have been shooting the virtual tours themselves. There's no property pre preparation. Um, like we're kind of trying to assist our our, the people shooting it will send out a pre-photography checklist, which generally gets the house in order. Um, but yeah, th there's been a, a ton of decluttering going on just because the agents can't get there and they're, they're unable to do anything about it themselves. Uh, it has been in demand. So what kind of uses did you see that surprised you? Like, did, did anyone sort of do stuff that you were like, wow, that's that's incredible. Like, wish we yeah. could that. Yeah, well, oh, um, well it's, we had an agent um, actually show us that we could use a third party app to create a 3D scan of any space and upload that to our virtual tour portal. And that became hugely important because, you know, areas like California, New York, Melbourne, more recently, people just couldn't get to the property. So the owner's uh, ability to scan and, and give then a, the client an immersive tour was really, really super cool. Um, the other one that I, that sort of came as a result of COVID was um, the bracketing app that we located um, for iPhones where we're able to take, you know, several images of the same scene at different light resolution and merge them together for a professional quality image. Um, that was highly, uh, it was such a cool outcome for people who really wanted a professional output but were unable to get to the properties. 
Very cool. And so with COVID, with us all starting now around the country to come out of lockdown, um, finally, go Victoria. Yeah. Um, do we, do you think, yeah, welcome back. It's great to have you. Um, mm. Do you think that your business, like, do you think that photo adjustment is going to go um, back to what it was? Is it going to, is it going to continue this way? Do you think we're going to see more homeowners taking their own shots still? Um, like look in areas where they were using it as a tool as a means to an end probably not um, as far as our usage rate I don't think that will go backwards um, probably more what happened during COVID as far as we were concerned is that um, agents really had to uh, they, they found if they weren't doing it already that they had to describe the property as best as they possibly could because the the tenant or the purchaser couldn't get there so that description process, whatever that looks like, um, whether you know that's a virtual tour, whether that's a floor plan, whether that's copy, whether that's a photograph um, or any of the other services that we offer, like whatever that is, um, agents really figured that it, the qualification process was better in, in, in the actual description. So a lot of people began using us that knowing we did the services, but that had no need to do it in the past. Um, I, I can't see them going backwards from that because the results of that have just been unbelievable. Now they know they can sell by doing less leg work, um, you know, it, it, rather than show a purchase of 15 to 20 properties. How about we qualify them for four or five good ones and, and you know, let's save us the leg work on the 10 or 15 extra. Um, it just seems crazy that we were operating under a system where people would openly cheer on social media and go, I've shown someone 30 properties. Well, if you've done that, you, you're doing it wrong. You mm -hmm. haven't qualified them in the first place. And a lot of that is your property description, mm -hmm. which is a large portion of what we do. So, you know, what if the, the, the one thing that we always encourage people before COVID, during COVID, and we will afterwards, is describe the property as best you can, because that will qualify any purchaser or tenant for that property. Yeah. And I guess, and it saves an awful lot of time for sort of tenants and but purchases as well. Like, mm. yeah, exactly. It's not like everyone wants to jump into their car on Saturdays and race around to, you know, 17 open for inspections to go and see stuff yeah, uh, and only, only to go, oh, it doesn't that... look like the photos. Yeah. And I don't know that that's going to change, Kylie. I like, you know, I think, I think the world has moved and I, I, I really feel, especially like personally, I feel that I'd rather qualify myself for a property before I actually get there. And a large portion of that will be, you know, things like descriptions, floor plans, um, I'll, I will be way more calculated about property purchases than I have been in the past. Um, I don't actually have the time to go out and inspect a lot of those properties. And I, I would imagine that, you know, the, the world has moved and people are the same. Mm, fantastic. Thanks so much. So nice. Nathan Krasansky from Home Prezzo, just give us a quick summary of what Home Prezzo does. Sure thing, Kylie, and good morning, everybody, <laughs> or good afternoon if you're in uh, the states that uh, have daylight savings. So uh, Home Prezzo is a content marketing platform. So we help agents with creating video and report content that uses local market data. So they uh, don't need to spend too much time creating all that content. They can do it in just a few clicks. Fantastic. So, so during COVID, you found that you were creating content for agents who had no properties to sell. What kind of um, marketing were they doing then? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as you said, when listings started to drop out, agents were struggling with what they were going to send to their database and send to their contacts because they didn't have have the listings. So we did see an uptick in people using our market reports because uh, even though, uh, as you say, the listings were coming off, there were still stats around around um, market values going up and people were still transacting. And, and on the whole, um, you know, a lot of the data was still positive and, and still showing a good picture of what local markets were up to. So, um, and, and even through transparency, right, even if markets weren't performing as well, um, showing that you were, were not afraid of that data and, and being transparent and, and open around what market was doing. Um, clients were, were really receiving that well and were looking for that information. So the agents that were taking advantage of, of platforms like us and, and using that content, not only did they have something to, to send and, and stay relevant, and they actually uh, you know, improved their profile in that sense that they were being seen as that local expert. Fantastic. So why is data such a powerful way to connect with buyers and sellers? Well, look, that is the new oil in marketing, right? So uh, I, I love that line, but it's so true these days. And, and you see it across not just real estate, but any industry. Um, 
any industry that's doing marketing at the moment. It's it's all about data. And and when I say data, we're not just talking about consumer data or, you know, anything like that, any any scary privacy things and, and things like that. We're just talking about um, being able to present data and, and use data in a way that you can tell a story and, and educate people and inform them about things in their market that they may not be aware of. And, and that's a really important part of it is that you do need to tell a story. And so that's where I guess our platform is, has really excelled and grown in that um, by using video, um, we can really take that storytelling of, of data to the next level. So it's it's really about looking at sort of what medium prices are doing and whether they've gone up or down and, and how... Um you know, how the market's been performing, rents, all that sort of stuff. It's that top line market data, isn't it? That's right. That's right. And and so by using the data of uh, who's clicking on that information as well, you're actually able to not only uh, segment your list and look at your list from in terms of, you know, who's who's opening your emails, but also who's clicking on those links and engaging with that content. And, and really that's showing you an intent of they are looking to make a move or act on something regarding their property uh, in the in the near term. So uh, there's lots of opportunities using that space. Yeah, because it's not just a story that you're telling that you're sort of sharing some useful information and people go, oh, yeah, cool. What you want as an agent is to understand the intention behind the person that's that's read that and, and that kind of content starts to signal, uh, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, so what were some 100%. of the best uses um, of content through your platform that you saw during COVID? Yeah, look, so for guys that were still able to do, uh, you know, up, up here in Queensland particularly, where we weren't in, in such... Uh, in lockdown for, for quite as long, we, we did see a lot of people still printing out our market reports and handing them out. So having having that option to still have a printed copy and, and deliver, you know, really nice quality marketing materials in hand. Um, but then on the flip side of that, where you weren't able to meet in person using those market reports in email and, and social campaigns to, to really you know, reach out to that top of funnel clients uh, and, you know, and looking to stay engaged. Um, and then right down through to say First National, uh, a large customer of ours where we integrated with Social Estate, their social marketing platform, and uh, we were delivering you know, 800, 800 plus uh, videos every single month um, that feed directly into the social media channels of, of over you know, 150 First National offices around the country. And those were being automatically um, posted to their, their Facebook uh, audiences. So um, from an agent's point of view, not having to do any work, but having that local market content being published around um, to their audiences automatically. So uh, that was a really great example of... of well, 800's of, a lot. How long did it content. take you to produce them? Uh, it, it takes us a few hours every month just to uh, press, you know, run it all out. But the, the beauty of the Home Prezzo platform is a lot of it's automated now and, and we do connect directly to the data from CoreLogic uh, so, so we can you know, refresh those relatively easily and, and get them updated and, and sent over to the platform. So it's a really key part of, um, of what the Home Prezzo solution does. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a really important part of, of what happened to us in uh, June, which was when we were acquired by ActivePipe. So um, one of the things that Home Prezzo did really well was creating content, but we weren't as good at uh, helping agents with how they sent it out. So we we started off with the idea of being Switzerland and anyone can share content wherever they like, however they like. Uh, and a lot of ways that created problems for agents because all of a sudden they had a, a great library of content, but they didn't know what to do with it. And so our answer to them would be whatever you want. And uh, that would kind of just uh, send them in a spin of, well, I don't know what I want to do with it. So help me. Um, and uh, so the acquisition of ActivePipe has really helped us with that answer. And now we can say, well, you know, the, your email campaigns and the way that you, you engage with your ActivePipe uh, system already um, has now gotten a lot better because you've got real con um, sorry home prezzo content to uh, flow into that as well and um, make that process a lot easier. Fantastic and just to be clear Active Pipe purchased home prezzo, home prezzo didn't purchase Active Pipe right? Yes very true. <laughs> yes, I'm, so, now, I'm, so... I'm not the I'm not Ash's boss anymore that's, no. that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so how did so so with the acquisition by Active Pipe now Home Prezzo's content is able to be sent out through emails and that's allowing that click through and being able to sort of see that engagement. Absolutely, just what we were talking about in terms of being able to pick up the, the intent of your database. So not only now you're sending out content and and looking at click through rates, you're also you know understanding that if they're clicking through on Home Prezzo content, there is a, a higher intent uh, in terms of what they're looking at. And I guess when you start to add a lot of those clicks up, 
you know, someone who's just clicked on one thing and, and done not very much for not very long compared to someone who's clicked on five things, that's where you start to see your, you know, lead generation um, and, and lead profiling start to build up. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So how do you see it going post COVID? Uh, look, I think, um, you know, people talk about the new normal. Um, I, I don't like that term. Uh, I think, you know, what will happen is that people have found that uh, there are new ways and technologies that can help them do their job better. And uh, they don't necessarily will, you know, they won't need to go back. And so I think a lot of the, um, the virtual tours and, and the digital content in you know, marketing uh, will continue and, and will continue to be relevant and important for clients as they've now accepted that they can do these sort of things from their home and, and not have to spend their entire Saturday um, driving around from house to house and, and spending hours in the car. So uh, look, from, from our point of view, I, I think things will continue the way they are despite you know everything coming out of, of lockdowns and, and things like that. Because mm. we have really made some efficiency improvements, or you know, improvements in the in the way that we're connecting and, and sharing information with our with our end clients, our buyers and sellers. So, yeah, so not right. a bungee, and, and so not a bungee ping. <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. I think they, you know, clients have, have just become so accustomed to that that way of communication now that it'll it'll actually feel really awkward for them to to have to go back to. Um, the way we used to do things in mm. the industry. So, yeah. Mm. Fantastic. So thanks so much. So Tom Dorowa from Virtual Tours Creator, your turn now. Hello, Virtual everyone. <laughs> now, look, Tom, Virtual Tours are not a new thing, are they? How long have they been around for? And why did oh, it take look. COVID for us to get used to them? Well, absolutely, yes. Uh, <laughs> COVID did probably um, was a big eye opener for any industry. Uh, but yeah, the virtual tours are nothing new. They've been here since the 90s or even before. Um, oh God, we God. actually have we actually have customers that you know tell us the stories how they used to make virtual tours back in the 90 back in 99. Uh, the only problem was that you know the internet speed wasn't good enough, so nobody could really see them. <laughs> they were clunky just... or they didn't work at all. But the technology was there, you know. Okay. I can just imagine the soundtrack to that. It would have been like a squealy, like, you know, like when your modem used to, used to work. Yeah, the dial-in modem. So so how, help me understand, Tom, how is a virtual tour different to a video tour? Maybe I'll just start the whole um, answer with, with saying that the biggest companies in the world always uh, put pressure on on the customer experience, you know, mm -hmm. and what the customers want. And um, and this is the same discussion between video and virtual tours. Um, virtual tours put the buyer or the tenant or whoever is watching them in the first seat, in their own perspective, you know. They decide where they go, how they do it, when they do it. Video is always going to be from the perspective of the real estate agent or the photographer. So they present to the final customers what they want them to see. And I think this is what um, the industry has to understand that yes, the videos are great, especially if they are, I mean, not the videos, video tours, uh, when they are done properly, um, but they don't show the size of the property or the layout of the property. They they always are going to have the agent in the background talking about the property and maybe not necessarily everyone wants to hear the agent and the agent is going to go through the house in a certain way. Some people maybe don't want to wait for half of the video for two minutes or however it goes to get to the kitchen when they can just open a virtual tour and click and have a look at the kitchen and then go back to a living room, whatever they want to do. So. I think the main difference is the power is in the hands of the viewers, you know, and it's and, and that's what's so important nowadays. I mean, we've all been talking about this prior to COVID, but nobody really listened. Now, when it all happened, um, it turned out that you know many agents are not digitally ready for anything, and um, and this is where it all started changing for, for all of us. You know, um, same in the virtual tours, you get a better understanding of the layout of the property, 
or even distances between things in the house you know yeah. um yeah so when so when you've got a virtual so when i've got a video tour basically i'm seeing the house through the eyes of the agent or uh, and it's giving me a sort of glorious glossy view of the house and and sort of spinning me the story as to why i'd like to live there um but when it comes to a virtual tour it's letting me go into the house and explore all the nooks and crannies or the the sections of it and to see how things connect up you know how different rooms connect up and uh and and more detailed self-driven kind of tour of it right yes absolutely look uh, i also i think it's worth emphasizing that you know the video tours are great if somebody does them properly and only a percentage of our customers and it's same what peter said uh, only a small percentage of agents can really shoot a photo um mm -hmm. when they want to do it semi-professionally um i talk to our customers they don't want to be behind the camera you know it's a big effort to walk through the house and talk to create a good video to create it properly it's going to take them time whereas mm -hmm. with virtual tours you just whack the camera in the middle of the room you press the button on your phone nobody has to see you you will it's it's easier it's faster in the end um and it's um, and it's also i would say more affordable you send the pictures to Peter. He wipes out all the clutter on the on the bench. He cleans the fridge of fridge magnets and cleans well, up the floor for you. <laughs> I haven't I haven't seen the decluttering ones from our customers, but definitely we send our customers to Pira and they exchange the sky. You know, when yep. when Melbourne is very gloomy, they make it shine. They make the sunshine. Hooray! Oh <laughs> so, yes, yes. So so absolutely. how so how did um. So, so what were your adoption? How how much adoption did you guys see during COVID? This is look. How much is, did you spike? This is this was incredible. We quadrupled the amount of agencies that we work with. Uh, wow. We could we we are so proud that we could have helped so many businesses during that time. And and you know and I don't have to make up any stories. We we've had agencies signing up. Um, not. Obviously, that everyone that was using virtual tours creator prior to COVID, they were ready. Yep. And it's not only sales, because we're talking about sales, we've got almost 150 companies that do just property management. And that was a huge part of the increase in use of virtual tours during COVID, because they had all their prop empty properties in as virtual tours, all photographed, ready to go. We had agents, um, Bigging and Scott in, in Stonington, uh, in June, they rented 41, during lockdown, they rented 41 properties sight unseen just because they had them as virtual tours. And COVID or not, last year in the same period, so it happens, they only rented 40. So they even did better during COVID with using virtual tours than they did last year. Wow. Wow. So, like the the take up, oh, I've got some amazing numbers because you probably also um, would like to know how many people were viewing the virtual tours. We've got our numbers. Um, you might have, you all have seen the numbers from REA, and that's also the the question between video and 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 uh, virtual tours. Four hundred ninety seven percent more engagement on listings with virtual tours. It's a no brainer. It, and it's not my numbers, you know, um, and I'm so happy that it all comes out. Um, but in the last year, I'm talking about period from January to, to June uh, 2020, and it's compared to 2019. In the whole country, we had 220,000 in 2019, 220,000 uh, people viewing virtual tours. This year, it's more than one and a half million. Wow. So everyone wanted to see that, but it's only they could have done it because the agencies allowed them to do it, you know, and I agree strongly with you guys and with Ira, and I've been always saying that I, I, I wouldn't really like COVID or not to go to the open houses, you know, driving around. Why don't you just have a look at what's available on your mobile phone in the comfort of your own house and choose the houses that you're going to see? But, you know, we have to put the co consumer first. And this is what I guess COVID told everyone. You know, there was, there was no other way 
uh, but only showing the properties by using proper photography, virtual tours, or some content that you can deliver, you know? Mm. Um, and also in property management, in, um, in the reporting part of it, um, a huge spike of use. We've got agencies with 4,000 properties under rent roll, um, and they, they pump out 220 tours a month. They love it wow. as a part of the entry condition reports, saving property managers at least one hour on taking random photos of just about everything, you know, where you can have a virtual tour and then you can complete it with a few proper photos of the actual damage or, um, so, or cupboards or drawers. So Tom, how does, how does having a virtual tour change the experience of buying or, or even renting right now? Well, it, as, as we said at the beginning, it puts you or the, or the tenant or the buyer in the driver's seat and you just, you know, click through the house in the comfort of your own home. You are not rushed by anyone. You don't go to an open house and you have 15 minutes to run through the house. And if the open houses are at the same time, you don't have to send your wife to one place, yourself to the <laughs> other, and then you can't even compare. And then have an argument. <laughs> But I'm not, and also, okay, and open houses are fine because they're still going to go. But then if you have a virtual tour, you can send it to the people that came to the open house and then they can compare it with their family and friends because nobody makes the buying or, or renting decisions by themselves. Yeah. And, in, and, and in, in, um, in rentals, it's just mind blowing. Um, and it's not just the people in Melbourne. It's also, you know, uh, people like professionals in Rockingham active agents, Tara Bradbury, they are absolutely winning listings just because they use virtual tours. That's another thing. How different are you from when you anyone else when you do the regular photo, video, whatever? It's all the same. Mm -hmm. Virtual tours are still a novelty, you know, mm -hmm. um, even though there's a lot of talk about them, not many people use them. And I'm right. surprised that, you know, um, agencies don't follow the competition and they don't see what they're doing. It's like they just don't. Um, and, um, and we've had during COVID, we had the likes of Nat Group, Edgar Natlo from uh, the closest to us on the Gold Coast. He's been winning property listings just because he was offering virtual tours because the other agents couldn't rent the property for a month or two. And the house owners would call them and say, Edgar, can you do something? He says, yeah. He would add a virtual tour professional set of photos and off you go and if you are in property management you would know that winning nine property managements a week that's what he was doing is a huge success wow. and he will tell you that this was thanks not only to virtual tours but also his brilliant marketing um, packages but many uh, one of those things are virtual tours you can present the property in a proper way so one of the benefits of virtual tours, though, too, is that it, it provides you with a data stream, a little bit similar to what we were talking about with Nathan, that you can start to see what people are clicking on. How, how does that impact on how agents can or should be marketing their properties? Well, look, this is, <laughs> this is a, 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 an, another new, new, new game, you know, marketing. We do provide virtual tours. We don't provide the marketing thing. But what we see from our customers, some of them that are really skilled, like Adam Freitas, uh, a BDM who uh, from Rain and Horn in Sydney, who was the winner of Excellence Award this year, uh, which is really unusual in the industry, is using virtual tours and professionally uh, edited photos uh, for, for his marketing packages. And that just wins him, um, wins him new listings just by having that in offer. But another thing is obviously advertising that on, on your Facebook ads. You know, you can post a virtual tours link to Facebook and it's going to stand out more than a photo video because it's just more interesting and engaging. And some clever agents, um, like professionals from Rockingham, uh, they use the virtual tour to attract, uh, to win uh, new listings by just advertising themselves and saying that if you, you know, for example, uh, sign up with us this month, we offer a free virtual tour. Click here to see more. And then they have a landing page uh, cleverly designed where there's a virtual tour and they all offer in the whole marketing package. That's something new, you know? So it's not really that difficult. 
but you know you just have to put some thought into it fantastic thanks so much tom so look let's open it up to the to um some general questions um it's been fantastic to hear everyone's hear everyone's point of view about their their technology and how it's been adopted but you all saw unprecedented adoption during COVID. Do you think the industry is going to keep using your platforms after things return to normal? Or do we think that um, that, that this is going to become the new norm, like Nath said? Who wants Let to grab that? Everyone jump in at once. Oh, well, I thought Peter <laughs> is going to start. I thought you friends. guys are going to be really chatty. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think in all three of the, the products, uh, you'll find continuance. I don't think, um, you know, I, don't, I, just, I just don't think, I think it comes back to what Nathan was saying before. I don't think people will uh, begin to use a product, find out how fantastic it is and then go, oh, COVID's over, we'll stop doing it now. Um, it doesn't It doesn't work like that. Once you're onto a good oil, you generally maintain that and you'll, you'll continue that. I mean, um, within market conditions. So if you find a better provider, that might be something that you look at. But um, once you've established that arm, you found a way to do it. And, and don't forget too, that's what a lot of people have been doing during COVID, whether you were, uh, were in a sort of one month lockdown or a, a six month lockdown as Melbourne got, um, a lot of people were actually using that time to, to better their businesses, what what things can we implement? Um, and a lot of the agents uh, I, I've been dealing with were treating it as though it was a um, let, let's go. We're we're getting ready to race. Um, here are all the things that we have to do before that. Um, now we're out of lockdown, as as the Melbourneites will be at the moment. Um, there are a lot of agents down there that are rare, ready and raring to go. So, you know, I wish them all the very best as they kick back into their businesses. But I, I think. You know, the, the whilst the period sucked and was terrible, they were totally people were getting ready, and I don't think they will stop using the services that are out there. Mm. I think so, you made a good point. Sorry, go, Kylie. I think no, you uh, Peter made a good point there. Where um, talking about you know taking the time to build your business. You know, there were a lot of um, you know retail businesses and even restaurants who were taking the chance of lockdowns to go do renovations and and um, do those things to your business that you wouldn't normally do because you're too busy you know, servicing customers and, and doing your, doing what you normally do. So I think we did see a lot of real estate agents taking that exact opportunity where if you couldn't, you know, if you weren't getting the appraisals and you weren't getting your listings and didn't have, you know, all the busy, busy work that you would normally have, you were taking that time to, to find new ways to better your business and be prepared for what would happen when you do come out of lockdown. Um, and we've got to remember that at the end of the day, we're in a service industry and we're there to help our clients um, on their journey. And so all of this stuff is going to be client led as well. So as much as we found, you know, benefit um, in our businesses to, you know, having virtual technologies and things like that, at the end of the day, the clients are going to be the ones that drive whether or not the industry stays on that path and continues to use that technology or whether, you know, they want to go back. And, and I think we'll, we'll find that they won't, that they've, they've gotten really accustomed to this. And, you know, there's, you know, you've just got to look at fashion sites that are selling, you know, business on top kind of um, fashion items now. People are getting used to the it's idea. The can, it's, it's the mullet. It's it's You can work uh... from home. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. The the fashion mullet. Um, you know, we're we're just going to see that change a, across the board, a, across all industries, and so that's uh, it's going to be client led, and and that'll continue. I'm going to confess I'm wearing my Ugg boots right now. Um, so <laughs> look, we're getting some great com uh, questions coming through from uh, from. From our viewers, um, a couple. One one question. Jen Harrison has asked, "Can you see a use case a user case beyond residential property, um, i.e., commercial or even retail property? Is anybody uh, doing stuff in in other real estate spaces? Pete, yes, you must yeah. be awesome. Yeah. Tell us I'd, about it. I'd I'd be saying uh, probably Tom is as well. Um, but we have a we have a whole website devoted to that. So if you go to boxbrownie.com and up the top is commercial real estate. It'll show you all the use case scenarios, but uh, commercial agents struggle with marketing just the same as residential agents do, just the same as property managers do. Um, they have a, a few more specific demands that as a previous commercial agent myself, um, we've kind of designed around that, like things like our virtual renovation, that'll take a, a vacant space and digitally show you what a, a retail coffee shop or a retail, uh, sorry, a retail outlet or a coffee shop looks like or something like that. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, and then we have our 360 virtual tour renders where we can actually create 
the space that doesn't exist in the exact commercial scenario that you have and you can walk through it in real time. Um, so there are all of those and I'll throw over to Tom because I'm pretty sure he'll be doing something in that space as well. Yes, oh, thank you, Peter. Absolutely. Um, uh, commercial is just as easy as residential to do the virtual tours. Um, it's, it's nothing unusual for us. I just mentioned in the answers that we already have customers. You can see examples in the gallery. Um, and, um, and coming back to the, also, if I can come back to the question about whether it's gonna, the technology, whether it's gonna stay or not. Um, oh, I think that absolutely it will stay. There's no going back. Um, but as Peter and Nathan said before, people, didn't have the time to implement this new technology because they were busy with improving their CRMs and training their staff and COVID helped them to, to stop. I mean, they had to stop and they had to think and, and you know, and, and before virtual tours were pretty expensive. So it was a, also a barrier of buying the equipment or getting somebody to do it. Now, uh, everything has changed. Uh, the prices of the cameras are much lower. Uh, anyone can do it. The implementation is easy, um, and um, and as our customers say, uh, there's no going back when they started. We can see the growth from month to month on the number of virtual tours that they're creating. Uh, but I'm not saying it's all uh, it's all perfect because you know there is a slight drop in in some businesses just because they have the old mindset, and when they don't have to. Uh, they will try not to do it, but you know it's always like that. Uh, but we we found some absolute um, innovators in the industry over the past few months. You're on mute there, Katie. She there? She's there. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still here. I had a schnauzer-related incident going on in the background, so I thought I'd better just go mute As myself. As you predicted. As I predicted, yeah. I have a cranky old lady who sits in the corner every day with me at work. Um, so, yeah, and as we, we're, what we're seeing through the data is this separation of those agents who are the real innovators and, and they're starting to separate from average, you know, average agent performance and, and those offices that have used this time to really double down on their technology are getting better and bigger and streamlining their processes and, and starting to take a lot more market share from from the bulk of the agents that are kind of sitting in the middle and, be and below. We've had another question, Tara Bradbury. Great to see you, Tara. Um, welcome to the uh, PropTech panel. One hey, um, is regarding floor plans and getting measurements, especially Pete, because I know you get them on the back of um, drawn on, you know, beer coasters or serviettes yeah. sometimes. Yeah, do you do. have any app recommendations to get those measurements more accurate, uh, faster? Actually, Tara, I'd hold five on this and g'day, long time no see. I think it's been all of two days since I last saw you, but um, it's good to have you on the on the webinar just the same. Um, the, yeah, look, I would hold five. Um, the iPhone 12 is allegedly coming out with what they're calling a LiDAR scanner on it. And I believe uh, that's the same device, just so you're aware that um, Tesla's are fit with um, in order to self-drive. So it's a scanner that goes out and scans spaces. And the word on the street is that we'll be able to map um, spaces. Now, uh, I think from memory, Tara has an iPhone X, but any of the iPhones and the Samsungs um, actually have a measure tool on them that creates measurements and they're fairly accurate. They're not the best, um, but they've gotten very, very fast. The iPhone 11 does that. Alternately, you can buy a laser measurer. We have that at our blog. Um, and there are also, I'd be remiss if I didn't say there are 360 providers out there that actually provide you with the space. You just need to ascertain as to whether you want to spend the money on doing the tour. They generally cost more, but yeah, there, there are all of those, those options available. I can throw in the five cents to that. Um, this is something that we offer already. We can create a floor plan for you out of your virtual tour without the need of measuring. So you just uh, have to pay 29 bucks and you're going to get a perfect floor plan um, made out of your virtual tours. So you don't have to worry about measuring at all. Hey, yes, Tom, does, <laughs> Tom, Tom, does that have the measurements on it? No, not with the exact measurements, mm. uh, but I don't know if many, um, many agencies really need those uh, measurements. That's what we created from the feedback from our customers, from the test groups. 
and mm. uh, they're absolutely loving it. Yes, yes. Oh, I would agree. I would agree with that. Most agencies don't need the measurements. I think Tara's question was about how do I get measurements for it? Like, how do I actually know the space? But yes, one hundred percent. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And so, look, one last question to sort of start to wrap us up. If there's not anything else coming through the the thing, um, the 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 two big things that seem to be changing that COVID really highlighted was the role of content and data in marketing going forward. Does anyone have any last comments around around that data play? Well, I'm curious to hear what Nathan has to say about that. <laughs> Here's the key I, I have. I have, a, I have a few comments, but I, I'd, I'd like Nathan to go first in this particular instance. It's kind of his ball game. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the extra time to think there, Peter. That was perfect. I just needed yeah. an extra five seconds. No, I'm, I'm kidding, of course. Um, the, yeah, look, I think I mentioned it earlier on, the data being the new oil, it's, it's driving all of this marketing. Um, we've got to remember that... Um, you know, without going into a big spiel about why content marketing works, the old way of marketing was shouting from the rooftops about how great you were and it didn't land, didn't land with everybody. And so the way content marketing switches that on its head is that you need to communicate one-to-one -one and you need to relate to your client and talk directly to them about things that they care about and that they're interested in. And so the only way that you can do that is to create really local content or personalized content for your individual clients, either one-to-one -one or, or in small groups um, that you can segment through, through your CRM and things like that. And so... That's a great idea and concept, but the biggest part about that is just how do you scale it? If you've got a thousand people in your database or even 200 people on your database, creating 200 bits of content or you know, even, even 15 pieces of individual content every single month, that's a lot of work, that, that's hard to do. And so data really drives the way that we can do that at scale and do that effectively because you can create really you know, hyper-local great content that feels really personal and, and feels like you know you have spent that time to create it for them, but you can do it in a way that's scalable and 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 is in line with your voice as a marketer as well and in your voice as a as an agent and an industry. So, um, you know, really, it, it's the you know it is the driving force behind what content marketing will will become. I have a I have a question along those lines, if you if I may. I, I know I'm a uh, question without notice. Um, yeah. <laughs> And anecdotally, the the agents in in my experience in talking with agents, I have no statistics on this. Um, but it, having spoken to agents, the guys who were doing content marketing and utilizing data in their marketing hit the ground running when COVID happened. Although they are reporting to me that there were dramatic changes in 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 the way that they would go about that, what they would do, and the content that they would put out there. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. So we we had a, you know, we obviously, you know, as a system, we're templated, you know, I, I, I'm sure people would understand that. I mean, creating content at scale, you've got to build it in a templated yeah. way. And so we did have to iterate really quickly on a lot of our templates to provide more COVID related or, you know, to, um, to adjust our messaging around, around this so that uh, it wasn't you know, completely tone deaf to what was going on in the industry, right? Like, you know, the content yeah. you were producing in January wasn't the same you were doing in March. It, it had to be, it had to be adjusted and, and changed. But at the end of the day, the data was still, it was still the same pieces of data. It was still the same information that you were presenting. It was just the, you know, and I, I touched on it earlier, the story that you were telling with it. So the way that you actually present that information and talk about that information had to change. So in the, in the, sorry to keep asking questions, but um, right. in, the, in the key areas of that, that we did a lot of work in, um, I'm going to say California, Florida, New York, Melbourne um, would be some of the biggest areas. And now, right now in the UK is the other area that we're dealing with where they're in lockdowns. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the guys are saying to me that, that the data that, that they were receiving it went out the window. It was very, very difficult to ascertain um, where the market direction had gone, dependent on that access to property sales. So here in um, in Australia, although again drastically reflected, we have auction rates which help, um, and that's an immediate way of knowing where the market's at. Do do you do you deal in micro data? Do you deal in smaller trends? Is do you look at that? Is that part of what you're looking at? Yeah, yeah. So we we are a we're not a, a data company. We're not a data analytics company, right? We're not. Mm. We're not trying to compete with CoreLogic or anything like that. So a lot of what we do as a as a company uh, is is take the information that those other companies are producing uh, and and using that. But um, we do work 
directly with with customers and with their own data outside of say CoreLogic or PriceFinder, and and so taking auction results or or taking uh, you know buyer trends uh, as an example more recently, um, mm. producing some content for Di Jones, taking their their own information around buyer trends that they've been collecting manually and, and using that in our content, um, and you know adding that scale I, I guess to that. Um, but yes, you, you're absolutely right. You you know people were um, you know there's an old saying in stats. There's you know uh, data, you know, well, stats, lies, and damn lies kind of thing. Like you can always make data tell the story that you want it to. Um, and so there's, there's sort of ways that that agents were working around that. But um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we all think about data as being medians and, and things like that. You know, larger areas. But you know, a sale, a single sale, is a data point. That's data that you can talk mm. about. And so data mm. doesn't have to be, um, you know modeled um, aggregated data sets from you know millions of sources it can be just an individual sale it can be a result um, yeah. that can be data yeah. that you can talk about yeah so in line with that here in brisbane i was watching with great interest well i'm on the sunshine coast but i was watching great interest with the brisbane agents who were experiencing an uptick an uptick in sales because they were open but uh, all up the coast uh, i know tara bradbury's on the call and she experienced this in property management the vacancy rates almost all went to zero. The, the property sales just went bananas. Um, and there are a couple of really, really good agents who are on the front cusp of that who just made hay while the sun shined, so to speak. Um, so yeah, I, I get what you're saying. I was just curious as to, as to how that played out. Yeah. Sorry to hijack the conversation, Kylie, but- No, no, like go it for it. No, no, <laughs> no, no, it's great. Um, well, look, Ladies and gentlemen, we could discuss this all day. I'm the only lady, but um, we could discuss this all day, but we are going to have to wrap it up there. Um, look, thank you so much to our panellists, um, Peter Shrave from Box Brownie, Nathan Krasansky from Home Prezzo, and Tom Dorowa from Virtual Tours Creator for your time and insights today. It's been great, fellas. I'd also Thanks like to... Me. I'd also like to thank the PropTech Association Committee, Simon Yates, Jennifer Harrison, Marianne Lampertang, AJ Chan and Kylie Billen for their help with this event. And a very big thank you to Stone and Chalk for getting behind it and for their support of Australian PropTech. So thank you everyone for your time. Thank you again to our panellists. Join us next month on Tuesday, November 24 for our PropTech panel on lead generation. So this panel was a bit of a mantle, but next month, I'm very excited. I have an all girl panel uh, on lead gen. <laughs> so this is Kylie Davis signing off. Thanks so much, everybody. <laughs>